Thanks and welcome everyone and welcome um, to our panel discussion. Um, so we wanted to have the conversation a bit about uh, mental health, but a new way of mental health, not looking at it as something that is a barrier, but something that can guide us uh, in empowerment and in our education systems and transforming our systems. Um, so I think we have a great panel that use different tools and different understandings. And I wanna go around and just, if you can quickly share with us in your work, as uh, we were, we heard um, different professions that you have, who do you empower and how do you empower those in your work? I will start with my mom. Um, so uh, before like answering your question, I would also want to like briefly talk about what empowerment means to us and uh, and to me personally as well. So a lot of times uh, when we uh, think about the word empower empowering ourselves, we think of like financial empowerment. We feel uh, there needs to be independence financially. Uh, and a lot of times uh, we are focusing our thoughts and our work uh, in that direction of being stable in our own lives. But a lot of times the other and the flip side of it uh, being emotionally uh, empowered and emotionally stable and having um, that system around you and building that system for yourself is often ignored because it's, I feel in my personal opinion it's also the more difficult part. Uh, the world focuses on finances and how much money you make and um, so that's something that we often ignore uh, or choose to neglect because it's sort of the harder thing to do. Um, so therefore, like empowerment for us and for me uh, is more about building um, the right systems for ourselves and for the children that we work for um, and creating that space that they feel comfortable in uh, talking about who they are, uh, what they want to be in, the, in, in their lives. and. So children are the center of our work, therefore, and empowering them means empowering them with the right set of tools, the networks, uh, the knowledge, and the skill that helps them lead better and more fulfilled lives. Of course, like financially stable and making the right money to sustain themselves, all of that uh, follows, and the world anyway focuses on that, but the other side. Uh, is what we're mostly focusing on through the power of arts. Thank you. And how about you, Romana? So, Assalamu Alaikum, Namaste, and hello to everyone. Um, in our work uh, at Kizazi, we work as a global not for profit. And very similar to as Umema has shared, our focus is really about what does it take for a child to be well, not just do well in life, but to really be well. And as we've gotten to know different countries, we work in India, in Armenia, and in different countries in Africa, we've gotten to know that a large part of what comes in the way of empowerment um, has been how we begin to see ourselves, our identities and all the different identities we carry with us, be they religious, or race, or gender, or caste, and all the different ways that in our schools, somehow there's no place for that. Uh, so in the books that we read in school, or in the songs that we sing in school, or the games that we play, we're really trying to say at Kizazi, how do we make schooling something that is so relevant to a child, a place where a child can see themselves, a child can be who they really are and grow up sort of um, almost restoring identities and cultures that may have been lost or that continue to be systematically oppressed and marginalized. So for us, empowerment very similarly is that. It's about finding who you are and really finding how you want to show up in the world. And when you find that place of inner, inner strength uh, or inner just oneness with who you are, uh, everything else sort of 
allows you to sort of do well. So that will naturally follow. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Parag. <laughs> uh, strangely, I shifted from medicine to gaming. So currently, I run a game company. Uh, obviously, that means that we work with young people across the globe. And while li living the medicine, one of the big things I realized is the question I was carrying is what is education? Because I worked in disasters. I worked in Gujarat, Afghanistan, on the border of Pakistan and India with terrorism. And when you go on the field, when you go with the community, when you are in the society, does what we teach or what we learn in schools is, effi uh, is effective or is it sufficient? So that was the question I carried, especially after the Gujarat earthquake where I worked as a doctor. And I realized that most of the doctors cannot work in a disaster area where there is no hospital, no nurses, and you have to work on your own, saving, rescuing people and treating them. And uh, uh, at times, actually, you see the death right in front of you. So are we trained for that? So that was the question. I, I realized that there is a disconnect between the real world and the education today because we are taught subjects like mathematics and geography. But when we go to the real societies, we don't know actually how many mothers die, how many infants die, what is the GDP, what is the PPP, all these things about the countries, about the rest of the world, we are not aware about. And one of the big things we talk in Ashoka, uh, Ashoka is a global organization of social entrepreneurs. We say that uh, the everybody should be the change maker. Maybe a change maker could be in the family itself because many families might have a lot of challenges themselves. Or somebody can work uh, across the globe internationally as a change maker. And what are the skills required to be a change maker? And these skills are very necessary, which are really, really very rare to learn and teach. So that's what my work is all about. Uh, we created a game called Real Lives, and Real Lives actually is used by a lot of young people across the globe, schools and universities. And that's how the change making abilities are built. Great. I think we heard very kind of different parts of empowerment, but they all go into one. But before we delve into more about kind of what you do and how you foresee education and all these things to change, I want to go a bit more back and a bit ask more personal questions as I think we should make this a safe space and talking about your own personal journey and your own personal struggles that actually made you want to be in this field, that made you realize that, you know what, financial empowerment and independence is good, but it's not enough. and. If you know what, what can you share from your own personal journey that led you to be in this profession, to have the compassion, and yeah, if you would like to share with us, Amarma. Uh, so as you started asking this question and just the uh, word personal lives, I started having this uh, really raised pace of my heartbeat. Um, so. Going a lot of years back, uh, so I'm an instructional designer, uh, and uh, my aim is to create fun and fun, engaging, uh, relevant classroom experiences for children and educators alike. Uh, but this entire thought uh, came from many, many years back uh, when I was in school myself, and I was in class 10 uh, then, and um, we found out that my father uh, had cancer and. Uh, those two years uh, of my life in class 10th and uh, 11, three years, 10th, 11th, and 12th, uh, where everybody, we would agree, uh, I think, talks about like uh, getting the right uh, course for yourself, um, getting the right marks, appearing for board exams, and all of those conversations were floating in, in, in the school. And uh, in my own personal life, I was dealing with something even more deeper that I could not understand then. Um, and while I knew uh, that my father was going through a difficult time and he was really ill, fighting for his life, but I did not know how to really accept all of those feelings. I actually did not even know what I was feeling then. And when I was in class 12th, um, uh, he left us. Uh, and that really left uh, uh, a mark in my in my life and like I was left clueless on what to do and everywhere like my friends and uh, in school we were just having this discussion on what to wear in the farewell or um, uh, like conversations like that which I did not connect with 
uh, I could not f find myself in that space in my school. Um, so uh, I felt like now and while I started working, I felt like this is something that I would want to have uh, in our classrooms, spaces where I wish I had teachers and that space where somebody could have just asked, uh, Umema, what's happening in your life? Do you just want to talk about that? Uh, or when my teachers knew what had happened uh, with me, they could have just taken uh, some time off to ask me or uh, to have uh, or to have like friends talk about it. Um, so, but unfortunately, we don't have that space. We don't have that space to talk about our own lives in schools. We don't have that space to uh, creatively express ourselves. We might not know how to talk about it. We might not have the right vocabulary. But can we have uh, processes and uh, practices in schools that might help us understand and even express whatever jumbled up thoughts that we have while we're in school, right? Uh, so that's some. That's the major event that really shaped uh, whatever I have done. In fact, everything that I have done in life, uh, probably I would say that that was the most defining moment for me where, uh, and I did what most people uh, know how to deal with sadness and uh, difficult emotions, is just to immerse yourself in something that you're doing. Uh, is to immerse yourself in either work or study, and that's what I did too. I start. I did my first job, and right after school, uh, I was still 17, um, and I started working then, and have been since. I've never taken a break or a day off at work, uh, like not a day off. That would be an exaggeration, but like a break from one job to another, because that has always been that thought that I need to. Uh, like do things for myself, do them on my own, and I've sort of, I, I now feel like in this position today, uh, at wherever I am, because of uh, my own new understandings of social emotional learning or my own mental health or understanding that, that I probably needed that time uh, to understand what I was feeling. Uh, I probably needed people and the network and uh, practices uh, that all of us are now working on uh, and as a child and as a youth uh, growing up I needed that uh, because eventually what happens is that these things come to uh, haunt you in a way or, uh, or come into your life in different manners of like heightened anxiety uh, and that's that's something that I still deal with quite a lot because whenever I uh, hear people talk about their experiences, which are similar to mine, uh, I just do not know how to uh, re respond to them well, uh, because it's just so difficult for me to accept these things. Uh, but I'm still working on that, and my work uh, requires me to uh, learn more about them, create these spaces where I can give children uh, and create lessons and create resources and curriculums that can create such powerful moments for children in classrooms. And that's, that's the beauty of uh, what we do. Uh, another moment, uh, I would say, um, or not a moment, but something that I feel um, like my own identity as a Muslim woman, that uh, has been something that I have struggled with quite a lot. Um, and I feel a lot of times I was scared to, uh, to accept uh, my own religious identities because of the heated, um, polarized, I would say, uh, scenarios that we have in India, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, like these simple things of just accepting your identity and who you are uh, also becomes difficult uh, at times because of various different circumstances that you are surrounded by. Uh, and with so, and that's another thing. Uh, that I have been very, uh, I'm not so sure uh, how to articulate that well right now, but that's another thing that I've been discovering and trying to understand how uh, accepting identities and accepting yourself uh, can also help you feel more empowered, can help you uh, deal with your own circumstances better. Um, so yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah. Thank you, we really appreciate it. And I think a lot of people 
have these moments in their lives and it shapes their identity, whether it's faith, whether it's traumatic events, whether it's you know moving or all these things. But it could also be small moments. It could be like you know little anxieties that you have or um, you know the rejections you get or the feelings that you have throughout growing up. So uh, thank you for sharing, Romana. Thanks, so, Mama. Um, I resonate with the the fluttering heart, and I think for me, I was reflecting as we started talking about this about my own experience with mental health, and was trying to think about when when did it sort of start for me. Um, and I was remembering I must have been between ten and twelve, similar age group, and our family had uh, a lot of financial crisis and. And we needed to move houses. I come from uh, Bombay, born and brought up there. And uh, so this was the first time we had to start looking for a new house. And so we go around. And this is South Bombay. I was going to a school in Kolaba. And the first time we went to a house, we really liked it. And we started talking to the owner. We were about, I, I think many of you know where the story is going. Um, and just as we were about to say, you know, we'd like to, to sign and sit down, and, and there it comes that, oh, you're Sheikh. Sorry, we don't give this house to Muslims. And that was the first. But then there was a second. And then there was a third. And it continued. It continued for a long time in Kolaba, in Andheri, in different parts of the city. And this is not my story alone, you've heard of this happening. But I think in that moment what began to happen was, oh, there's something wrong about being Muslim. I didn't think of that before I was 10 or before I was 12, it was my normal. And suddenly that in that moment of being said no, a line was drawn not just for me as a 10 year old, for my entire family, a line suddenly was drawn and then we began to realize, oh, we are the other. And why are we the other really? And from there, just as you shared, oh my, my, it began a process of, there's something about me that's just wrong. Uh, and as a 10 year old, it's hard to know what to do with that. Uh, it's hard to know how to make peace with that. And these were houses that I had friends in, the same building. So then you begin to not know whether you can actually show up as your Muslim young girl self, even with your friends, because their neighbors don't want you. And so what I didn't understand then about identity and all the words I use today in my work was really what began for me then. It, it started as panic attacks. It started as a distrust. It started as just confusion in who am I and what is wrong with me? Um, and there begins the breaking of self-esteem. And today when I look back, I realize I had privilege. This is South Bombay. Both my parents are educated. We speak English. And so we had a certain social class. We had a certain access. And yet, I have to experience this. So there's definitely something more that children need and that we need as a society than just money and, and speaking English really well. There's something else that comes in the way of us being well. There's all of these other things that happen outside us in society, which today we would call systemic injustices. And those really impact us inside. And that's what starts trauma. That's what begins to chip away at mental health. And so it's really this exploration of how does systemic injustice outside impact us on the inside. That's the exploration that over the years now I've found the language to, and now it sounds like it's all in a framework, but it really started for me as that 12-year-old who suddenly realized, oh, there's something wrong with me. I am an other. 
Thank you so much for sharing. That was very powerful, to say the least. Um, how about you, Parag? You actually changed from being a medical doctor yeah, yeah. to you know, doing games. Um, was that like a teenage yeah, fantasy? So, so, <laughs> <laughs> so three, four things. One is uh, my home got washed away uh, in Pune floods, 1961. Of course, I was not born, but my father lost everything. And I could see the repercussions of how you lose the house, your home, and then how the family suffers. So that was quite a long time. So that was one impact. And one of the things actually we speak in Ashoka is connecting the life, you know, how the life connects. The second big impact was uh, I was in uh, Punjab. <coughs> uh, uh, I was in a school called Nana Prabodhini. I think a lot of people might know. Uh, I was connected with it. And I was sent to Punjab to work with the terrorists, why young people become terrorists. And then me and one of my friend who later became IS officer got abducted uh, by, a, uh, by a group of terrorists. And that was the first time at the age of 2021 I, I saw death right in front of us. And then we escaped of course, I, I am alive. <laughs> so, but that was one very sharp uh, experience I have, like how people, young people can think and how they can become a terrorist minded and why actually they are kind of completely brainwashed to do something like that. So that was a big experience at the age of 2021. The third of course is uh, <coughs> the Gujarat earthquake which I spoke about. But you know one of the things was uh, a very young uh, girl came for the delivery right in the morning at 4 a.m. And my gynecologist refused to operate her. She required a cesarean section and I said why? So he said, no, there is no hygiene, there is no operation theater. So if I don't, if I operate and if something goes wrong or infection happens, then I'll be responsible. So I said, boss, do you understand that if you don't do anything, the, the lady and the child is going to die. So you have to do something. So I took the responsibility and that was another thing, uh, like, like I said in the beginning is what is education and are we really doing the purpose of education in the right way? So that was the third thing. And then I realized that life is a game, you know we all say because it's everything is sudden we don't really we we feel we plan everything in a big way but the things happen in such way that you don't have any control over it so life is always described as a game so i said why not go into gaming and that's how actually all these experiences were brought into the game we developed and it's really fabulous now romana actually you know uh, we keep hearing about muslim stories but i have my personal experience because i am surrounded by a muslim community and you know, like uh, one family used to, uh, for this, uh, you know, uh, Eid, the goats were sacrificed. And they used to maltreat these goats so much that it affected me in a very big way. I, I still get the tremors in my life. The practice was that the goat should be killed. Of course, that it's a religious practice. The way you kill the goat, you know, it was so horrible that uh, ultimately I went to the police I said actually I spoke to the family I said that this is not good practice your young kids are no these are very terrible experiences we have you know and they affect us hugely in our life because you know my family is a vegetarian family we are Hindus unfortunately in this India and we have to you know <laughs> do so many things uh, which are really really uh, so you know ultimately that problem sorted out because I went to the mosque, I spoke to the Maulavi, I said, this is not the religion's practice, you say. But I still get affected because it's, it's like everybody eats chicken and everybody eats goat. But you know, like when you do these things, then it's a, it's a problem. So I don't know what is the solution for it. But because you mentioned it, I had these memories coming very strongly in my mind and it really got affected. So you know, I say that it could be local, right in front of your house or it could be Afghanistan where I worked. So you know, the problems exist everywhere and we have to really find the solutions as change makers to the problem. Thank you, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's, it's the kind of how to make both stories heard and you know, talk about it and say, okay, this is my experience, this is your experience, how we can make sure that we each impact each other positively. And I think we talk a, a lot about what is needed, especially in education, schools, to, you know, to respond to people who are students, who are kids who are going through trauma, kids who are just, you know, trying to figure out their identity, 
kids who you know deal with different situations of lives and different experiences but i want to get to like so what can we do what schools can you what do you think you you mentioned social emotional learning what can exactly schools do we have an audience of authors teachers and if we want to tell them what are the tools that you think can be implemented and should be implemented to actually meet these needs what do you think uh, so slam out loud uh, the organization that i work with um, we attempt uh, creating safe spaces for children in schools and uh, we do this by leveraging the transformative power of arts so we leverage uh, theater, poetry, storytelling, visual arts as mediums that would develop creative confidence skills in children. And we define creative confidence as a set of social, emotional, and 21st century skills which are relevant for children uh, in today's day and age to live healthier, uh, more sustainable lives of their own. Um, so uh, that's the crux of uh, where we work in. Uh, we believe that uh, social emotional learning is a tool that uh, can, and not just a tool, but so like uh, coming back uh, to your question, just um, sorry, I just lost my thought. Um, so introducing uh, and having these spaces for children to talk about their own selves and their own lives through uh, systems that we introduce in schools. This could be like. Uh, leveraging the games period or leveraging the arts period and making it a space that they not only create like a landscape or a house but also talk about what it means for them to live in one and what their life looks like uh, and sharing that in a classroom and creating that uh, space like you had said where everybody shares uh, where different people are coming from uh, and introducing these smaller interventions in school is important as a system. Uh, but what is even more important uh, is, of course, like having these systems in place, but also uh, practicing social emotional learning as a philosophy across the institution. Uh, when I uh, say philosophy, I uh, broadly mean like a lot of times what happens in our schools is. Uh, a new intervention or a new pedagogy gets introduced and that is then taken to classrooms to ed educators are trained and students take up uh, that course. Uh, but otherwise in their own lives, in schools, r outside the four walls of their classroom, but they're still in that institution, say, engaging with uh, the canteen staff or uh, while they're playing in the playground uh, or when they're uh, connecting with the admin staff. How do each person uh, how does each person focus on social emotional learning and uh, how do we get that into our everyday vocabulary uh, is really important uh, and that's what I mean by philosophy having of course uh, systems and processes uh, would be the first step like introducing students to uh, these interventions and like training educators but it's also important that we have these discussions with everybody in the institution with parents that are involved in uh, a child's development and having this uh, together as a philosophy is what I believe is needed. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I think it's this idea that it's not just the counselor at school that needs to be on board. It's just not the arts teacher, but it's even the person who does your admin. You know, I, I remember when I was um, younger and I went to a high school just kind of to do the exam, the administrator, she was so rude and so like really not understanding or at all to like a 13 year old girl. I felt like I, I couldn't go to that school. It was just too much, you know, that experience. So I think it's that, that philosophy, like I did end up going to that school because it was the best high school in the area. But every time she would walk down, I would still get stressed because of that one interaction I had with her. So I think this philosophy that has to be everyone, it's very important. Uh, just to add to that thought, uh, while schools are smaller institutions, they also function within the world and the city that we're in. And people are not different. People outside might have different roles, but inside they are teachers. Uh, they're um, uh, the staff that you are surrounded with. They're probably taking you home in that school bus. So mindsets are what we need to work on. Uh, 
and this is what happens when like interventions like these are introduced in schools students like muskan supriya or abbas who shares the same religious identity as me talks so openly and so confidently uh, about his religious uh, identity his own identity as a boy uh, as somebody who's young and confused about his life uh, but he's able to articulate that at the age of 14 uh, something that i struggled with uh, all my life as a youth i still am uh, and that's an ongoing journey but when you create these spaces it fast tracks that pace for you to understand uh, who you are how about you ramana um how can what are the tools that then we can turn you know personal transformation into system transformation and um what are the tools that you work with yeah um i think uh, just as umema started the the safe space for dialogue i think that's what i wish we would have had as children uh or or we have as neighbors uh because what you raise i'm i'm sorry you had to see something that was so hard for you as a child uh, and that's important that there are practices in all of our cultures that are different for each of us to see and engage with and it's it's about this dialogue so i appreciate you bringing that up and saying how do we solve for it uh, because that might have been a much more helpful thing uh, for my parents to have heard that hey it's not you there's this one practice that that makes it difficult for us uh, and then we can problem solve around it as societies so imagine if we had that in schools like you were saying that space for us to talk about it for us to say okay how do we live together uh, is there a way to coexist so dialogue is a big part of what we try and bring in in schools um and starting with just can we just check in with each other can we acknowledge how are we feeling today can we acknowledge each other uh can we learn to talk to each other so dialogue is a big practice we use uh we also work uh, similar to how you're saying in communities that are uh, that have experienced a lot so it could be history of civil war it could be a ongoing conflict um and in those communities we also try and bring in different ways to help young people uh regulate so if we're talking about mental health we're also talking about its impact on our body so whether it's the panic attacks or whether it's uh, if you go into a classroom sometimes i had this one child uh, in a class who found it very hard to pay attention um and every few minutes i would turn to the board to write something if i turned around he would have run somewhere and he'd be under a desk somewhere and he was he would be shaking uh, and it took a while to understand what that was as a new teacher it was it was just confusing for me as well but today we can understand that there is there is something it called dysregulation uh there is a nervous system that is getting too agitated um and how do we bring in strategies uh whether it's mindfulness whether it's dance whether it's singing a lot of it really comes back to play really um so how do we bring in different strategies and that really starts with also the adults so even as adults can we begin to recognize when we are getting too anxious can we recognize oh there's something in me that's that's getting agitated right now um and before that comes out on the kids or before that comes out on my colleague or my partner at home how do i just take a breath so we try and bring in both the understanding that comes from the the science and the physiology of it and then the strategies so just taking a deep breath which is something i'm feeling the need for right now so if it's okay i'm just going to you can join me but i'm just going to ask us to just take a pause i'm feeling a little um, agitated do in class as well just focusing on the out breath yeah it's just allowing 
whatever it is that may be agitated right now, or if not, for me it is. And thank you for holding that together. And thank you for sharing that. So our problem is uh, bigger. Ch climate change and global warming and everybody is getting affected. So how to solve this problem is a big question for all of us. And especially young because they are the next generation, they are the future generation. Now one of the big things uh, we organized in Pune uh, was a conference called Young Change Makers and about 200 schools used to participate and this was one of the halls we used where young people find some solutions. These are from 7th, 8th and 9th standards and they do the research. They Actually we found about 150 problems in the society. For example, you know nobody teaches us how to talk to a blind person and I am not joking. If, you, if there is a blind person sitting next to you, I am I'm very sure that you don't speak to him or her. And this is actually, I, I learned this when I went to Baba Amte and he said that para, uh, one of the leprosy patients is going to serve you the food tonight. And how you feel, just tell me. And I was very frank with him. I said actually I was really stressed out and I really was, uh, was re really feeling extremely, extremely uh, sad. So these are the things, you know, these are the skills which are not taught in the school. So how you bring these skills? Now one of the big things we talk uh, in Ashoka and of course it's Salzburg is being empathetic. And teaching empathy or learning empathy is not that easy because it's like swimming. You cannot learn swimming through a textbook. And the entire syllabus, entire school system is based on syllabus and the schools and books and everything. So, so the games are highly immersive. What you play from games or what you learn from games is, is really what you own yourself. Now one of the big things, as I said in the beginning, that life is a game. And one of the simple things we used is that why you cannot be born as someone in the game and you live a life of that person so that you start understanding what it means to be a girl in Afghanistan or a, a very poor family in Liberia or maybe in India also of course. And what are the different shades of you know all these things which happen around you. And I am very happy that we have now about more than 3 million people who play the game. Uh, this is game driven by the real statistical data of the world. So when you click to be born randomly, like nobody decides where to be born, which religion to be born, uh, which place to be born, what kind of family to be born, you are suddenly born. And then you start living the life. And all that happens in your life happens in the game. So there are lots of research papers written on this game. And one of the biggest research paper which is written by a psychologist called Kalen Sikalas from New York and she says that this game has really very strong and very powerful ability to counsel young people because these are the people, millennials and Generation Z, who may not sit in front of me or their parents or their teachers because they find ours is a generation which is different than the, the generations of fathers and mothers and teachers. So that is one. And secondly, uh, what we found across the globe is that we talk about the next generation to be capable, next generation to be very effective and efficient in terms of dealing with climate change. But what about teachers? What about teachers who teach them? They come from mindset which is teaching a subject or teaching my subject is geography. I teach geography. But there is a huge connection of geography and economics. We all know. And this is not brought in the schools at all. So when you are born in a say sub-Saharan Africa, you are in a geography, but because there is nothing around you, you are also poor. Now how you solve these problems? The other thing was uh, we were working with an uh, organization called IRMA, Institute of Rural Management in Gujarat, and they, uh, Amul, so they created Amul Vargis Kurian. Uh, so one of the big thing is how you understand the village uh, to be uh, functioning, how Indian villages function, because the Amul story, the success story of Amul is based on the village and uh, village uh, farmers and the way they bring milk and all other things in Amal. So this was another uh, big exposure to us that how the poor people or the village or where there are no resources, how these people function. And then we started creating these games which are used by schools in cities or in New York or in uh, Seoul in Korea or in Perth in Australia. And they started realizing that these are the skills a lot of these people have. So sometimes, you know, having uh, something around you which is like a game, probably helps. And the last point is, uh, I, I am a huge fan of a person called Brené Brown, and she talks about vulnerability in a big way. So being vulnerable is a great skill. But you know, in the current situation, if you see Pune, Mumbai, anywhere in the world, our children are so much protected that 
is that bus is safe and of course like uh, of everything being safe everything happens around you so being vulnerable is the greatest attitude greatest gift of the god and we all should uh, train our young people to be vulnerable somewhere in their life about many things and that's how the skills are built so this is how the real life has all these methodologies and we use it very powerfully in the classrooms thank you so much so before we close i would like to ask if there are any questions from the audience to the panelists hello am i on the uh so so uh, my question is to both the ma'am since you told your personal stories and we're talking about mental health do you think uh, that there is a need for the person who is pursuing psychology and wants to be a counselor there should be a background check if they are compatible enough to be a psychologist because in the past few days i came across that where i needed counseling uh, very badly and i went and this lady who had experience of past 30 years of counseling told me that it is good to have abandonment issues because that contributes to being independent in your life again um, sorry you had to go through that uh, and i i think anybody who's tried to get mental health support has a couple of experiences that takes a while to find uh, the right support i know in my training when i when i got my training as a psychotherapist a large part of the training was for us as psychotherapists to do our own work um and i i found that extremely helpful it helped me understand my own biases it helped me understand my abandonment issues and because so much of therapeutic work and actually a teacher student's work is really relational work it is about our relationships and and so we end up sometimes if we aren't aware enough and if we haven't done our work it can come out in work with others and and we see that in classrooms we see that at our homes as well so i don't know if it's a background check only i would say recognizing that all of us as humans have our struggles with mental health and if we're going to take on the profession of helping how do we create the the system to support our therapists so where are the therapists for the therapists <laughs> uh, and and can that uh, be part of the training i found that extremely helpful and i think that would allow us to have a more caring system overall i i think ramana is more trained and more experienced to answer this question um but from my own understanding and my own therapy sessions um i would say even i took a few uh checks and a few sample sessions uh to eventually uh end up at the one that i did uh but i feel uh rightly said by romana every one of us is going through our own journeys and even therapists or people in the profession who might be experts might also have their own struggles and issues and they might not necessarily know how to best deal with them um so while so we just need to be kind to everyone in that sense um uh, just giving people that space that they might not be the best people to give you advice for that particular thing and they're on their own journey and probably and hopefully will find that for themselves too to also lead better lives for others thank you i once had a counselor who fell asleep while i was telling a story so <laughs> yeah <laughs> um any questions yes two questions sir i'm asking this question from the personal experience as a listener of this session so majority of the session was based on mental health but as a listener i felt that session took a different angle in between and it went other way around so my question is while discussing a particular topic can we avoid specific attributions which can lead to certain discomfort of some people or can have a opposite view or can be a controversial view so can we focus on the main topic avoiding the specific attributions about religion caste creed 
I think maybe I should answer that question. <laughs> I think I I understand, but I do think what the the goal of the session was very much about talking about this topic, and we we started the conversation where we wanted our breakdowns to be our breakthroughs, and how each of us our personal journeys but then it's mirrored in what we do. And I think then all of us have this education and school at the heart of it. So that's where a lot of conversation was at how this, a lot of these comfortable thoughts or you know, topics about faith, about you know, trauma, all these things are very normal, but they are not normal. As you say, it could create uncomfortable feelings. It could create a lot of points of conversation, discussion, and I think we should start having those. And us as authors, as you know, people who write things, who will shape stories, we need to be able to co be comfortable about sharing these stories because that could impact someone. If there's a teacher here, they could start thinking about, okay, how can I go and ask my student tomorrow, are you okay, how are you feeling? Or real life games, you know, just, just thinking about the thought of like, oh, maybe I can introduce that to my students to then imagine how it feels to live in this specific country or this specific part with a social economic background. And I think this place could be a good place to actually have those conversations. Uh, but it could also not be. So that's also another point of discussion and conversation. But the goal is to put seeds of thoughts and inspirations for your stories, for your thoughts, and for your own conversations. That's kind of how I feel. I would just like to add to your thought as well. I feel why, why should these conversations be difficult? I mean, why do we need to associate the word difficult with these terms? Uh, and a lot of times, um, especially in India, religion, faith, caste, uh, these are uh, terms that we usually associate as difficult conversations we and we avoid them. Uh, avoid talking about them while we're in buses or traveling with others because what if we are having a conversation somebody just hears in. That's a fear that I have, uh, by the way. Uh, or while I'm traveling, I would I want to say assalamu alaikum uh, over the phone to my family or would I just avoid using that and say hello so that it's uh, easy. We shouldn't be living in a world which is like that, you know. I wouldn't want to. Uh, and I want to change that. And this is important to talk about and to have systems in schools that enable this conversation, makes it simple, makes it easy for all of us to have this. Even conversations of gender. Uh, so a lot of our work at Slam Out Loud has focused on uh, how do you understand gender through SEL? How do you understand climate change? Uh, and the climate anxieties that you feel, how do you develop that? Uh, because for somebody, that could be a difficult conversation. So at what point do we say, hey, let's, let's just talk about everything that we're surrounded with because that's important. Uh, if it's difficult, uh, let's make it simpler. Just to answer you, I have traveled uh, almost all the world. But I am very proud that in India such things can happen and India is very open to do this. My question is for Dr. Parag. Uh, the very idea I find fantastic where you have a game where you can be born anywhere in the world and it's not just virtual world but real life world and you live your life the way you actually would. This is unbelievable uh, teaching uh, aid, I would say. So, can you tell us what is the name of that game and how do we <laughs> get that? I'm an how educator. How can we download it now? <laughs> no, I'll be brief because it's only three minutes. But uh, I'll talk to you later. But one of the no, I have two Nobel advisors on my uh, on my company, and both of them they met you like uh, you are saying something. They were in the audience and they came to me saying this is fascinating. And one of the Nobel laureate uh, is called Lee Hartwell. His uh, Nobel Prize is in Cancer Genetics. And he found out in 2001. And he came to me talking about that, is empathy really a precursor for you know, outcomes of cancer, for example? And you know, when I speak about empathy, empathy is really, really uh, a virtue which is given by us, by the God, maybe. 
uh, but it's a mirror neuron as you know you know like the way we anticipate the world and way we learn uh, from the world is the mirror neuron theory from the neuroscience so he said parag i want to re really do the research and we are in uh, really good touch he is at arizona state university and he said that maybe there is a possibility of uh, 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 cancer outcomes and empathy as as the as the as one thing and secondly i would like to tell you the the as you are educator the education is shifting to student driven education it is no more teachers i go to the universities like eth in switzerland or seoul or even pune university or anywhere the professors are telling me that they are scared to go to the classes because students know more than what teachers know because for example see gravity so i can learn gravity on khan academy on a youtube channel and why the teacher should tell me any more about it what is what I, how i can fly a rocket is the is the practical implications of learning gravity if i don't get teach taught about that in the school then i lose my interest in the school and this is what actually the real life does is that it's completely student driven when i go to the classrooms anywhere in the world where real life is being used the teachers are standing behind the students and this is what i want to see in the world that teachers are not right in the front of the uh, students because they have to be responsible for what they want to learn in the in their life and Amazing. that's how actually the real life is thank yeah. you maybe one last question um uh, first of all i would like to applaud the panel uh, you spoke about mental health in all its intersectionalities uh, so it was really nice to understand how you spoke about religion how you spoke about your personal experiences as well as how important it is to be comfortable in talking about difficult issues uh dr parag you mentioned something about climate change and how that can also lead to mental health so there are two things i would like to you know, ask and understand here uh one is to understand that uh, we spoke about many other aspects but i think we completely omitted talking about hyper capitalism and how that is creating so many mental health issues uh and where climate change you know as a subject in a way is a fallout of that kind of hyper capitalism so in your uh, you know practice of being um i'm sorry i missed this uh, earlier part of the session so i do not exactly know what your background is apart from what you mentioned about the games but in this practice of uh, mental health how do you associate hyper capitalism and its effects on climate change and then leading to mental health issues it's a very tough question i am sure about it i'll try to answer it very short uh, maybe somebody would like to also but i th i think you know the mental health and climate change are connected like you said because to build yourself as a human being and what you should really use in this world and that is what real life brings in is that there are 5 billion people in on this earth who are extremely in challenge they don't get anything and there are 1 billion people who might get everything in them around so that is one i am very driven by a documentary called true cost and it is about the garment industry or the cloth industry in the world and it is one of the best documentaries i have seen that how you can control yourself it has changed my own behavior for example i have not bought shirt and pant for last 3 years in my life or 4 years almost i keep using them again and again so you know it starts from your personal uh, beliefs and how strong you are in dealing with the climate change and something around you and i am also happy that my wife uh, it's it's not the right platform to say but last 12 years we are uh, consuming our entire garbage of our home inside and there are a lot of people who visit my home for the garbage uh, uh, culture we have my son is architect and he works only in mud architecture and he builds only in mud so you know these are the kind of young people which i see who are coming up extremely strong and they might uh, do something i think i think we can have a better education system so the next generation policy makers actually care about climate change and mental health thank you to romana omeyman parag and thank you everyone have a great rest of the day <laughs>